Whenever Australia deploys troops, they can only deploy if there are medical and health teams. And those teams comprise doctors and nurses. And teamwork is essential in the context of military medicine. In August and September 1914, uh, the Australian medical system was totally unprepared for anything which was to engulf them over the next six months in the huge battlefields of, uh, of Gallipoli and subsequently in uh, France uh, and in Sinai. When it was realised that Australia had nothing in September 1914 beyond uh, regimental or battalion medical officers, very hastily the field ambulances had to be raised and trained. And certainly uh, the first site of definitive care, that is the, then the casualty clearing stations, the field hospitals of today, uh, had to be raised really from civilian ranks. And Australia's number one casualty clearing station, which was raised in Tasmania, took uh, four or five civilian doctors, a sergeant dentist, a dispenser who'd been trained as a medical student, and 63 civilians who were orchardmen, leather dressers and chauffeurs. They had a hastily nine-week training in first aid and they formed the definitive uh, unit, number one casualty clearing station, which was on the beach at uh, Gallipoli and received this enormous, overwhelming mass of uh, desperately wounded and dying men, 2,000 in the first seven nights. In that first week after the 25th of April 1915, the military units there were totally engulfed, overwhelmed with, with casualties. For example, on the first night, uh, 25th of April 1915, there were 780 surviving, severely wounded, who were brought to the beach and they were being treated by nine doctors and 43 really first aiders who'd been recruited from the civilian world in Tasmania. One of the things that was learnt steadily during World War I was that the further forward you bring your surgical team, the sooner you can bring your casualties to surgery, the greater the salvage rate. In today's environment, the number of casualties is tiny. Uh, I mean, in the whole of the, uh, the decade that we were in Afghanistan, there were about 40 uh, fatal casualties and a proportionate number of wounded. Um, whereas in World War I, it would be nothing to have half a battalion wiped out in an attack. That's 500 people. And some of the battles that we know about, you know, like, like Fromel, 5,500 casualties. The first day on the Somme, 60,000 casualties. How we could possibly manage to deal with casualties on that scale I can't, uh, I can't begin to, to understand. Captain John Thomas Jones said in a letter to his mother earlier in the war that really all you needed as a doctor was uh, a syringe and some morphine, bandages and plenty of water because that was really your, your medical first aid, relieve pain, stop bleeding. Later, however, um, because of the number of, of casualties who were dying, because the treatment didn't get to them early enough. There were advances in intravenous fluid resuscitation and indeed the beginnings of blood transfusion, although that really didn't come in in a big way until World War II. The First World War, of course, was the, one of the great milestones in the, along the path of gender equality for women. Nurses could serve in the uh, forces uh, in uniform in the First World War. The Australian Army Nursing Corps was formed at the same time as the Australian Army Medical Corps in 1903. The nurses served in theory in the later casualty clearing stations, but certainly they took a very major role in the general hospitals. But the general hospitals, because of the nature of the mass of uh, casualties that came, uh, really were dealing with uh, what essentially were only very partly stabilised victims and uh, they were overwhelmed in places like the general hospitals on the islands off Gallipoli, for example in Midros where our, our big general hospital was and they, received, they were receiving mass casualties uh, coming off the hospital ships there and they were engulfed by that. And many of the nursing diaries tell of the exhaustion and the overwhelming feeling of helplessness that uh, engulfed the nurses. But uh, Australian women doctors 
were not allowed to uh, en enlist, women doctors wishing to serve in the forces had to join other services. The wonderful record of women's service in the First World War is related to the Scottish Women's Hospital movement, which was raised in Scotland but had its headquarters in Endell Street in London. And uh, a number of Australian women doctors served with great distinction. Uh, the most uh, famous from the Queensland point of view was Lillian Violet Cooper. She enlisted with the Scottish Women's Hospital and served on the front line in Serbia with her partner, Miss Bedford, also from uh, Brisbane, who was her ambulance driver. The horrors of the First World War left many scars, of course, and much unanticipated legacies, both in the medical world, but also in the broader civilian world. And the story of uh, unrecognised shell shock uh, is one of the best examples and the very high levels of uh, individuals we now know who are unable to, to re-enter their civilian world. Alcoholism, chronic alcoholism rates were very, very high and there was the other tragic diagnosis of LMF, lack of moral fibre, which we now know was just uh, in many cases hysteria or uh, the natural instincts of self-preservation that uh, prevented men going into minefields occasionally. Of course, that was a capital crime in military terms uh, in the First World War. And, but we now realise that uh, the uh, self-preservation instincts can apply, apply to everybody if the stress is greater enough. But from the point of view of doctors themselves coming back, uh, they came back in honoured positions. And we know that if one comes back into those circumstances, there's a very low rate of psychological problems. There's two ways that doctors and nurses cope. First of all, they're doing something positive. So there's always something that you've achieved. And the other thing is that there is a very tight-knit camaraderie among teams doing medical work in these kind of situations. But having said that, um, doctors are just as exposed to the dangers of, of uh, gunfire um, 34 were killed in action in World War I, uh, and this was often because they were right up the front dealing with casualties, and um, usually they were killed by, by, uh, by shell fire. It became necessary, as the war went on, for the War Office to issue a directive to medical officers, uh, instructing them not to go out and pick up casualties. Um, naturally, uh, if you were a battalion medical officer, you were concerned for the, the men in your care and when there was an attack, you went forward as quickly as possible picking up the wounded. This, of course, exposed you to a significant risk of getting killed yourself and the War Office felt that um, doctors were more use alive uh, let other people pick up the casualties. Generally speaking, nobody took any notice of this. Following the, the First World War, uh, a number of systems have gradually evolved since that time. Perhaps the most important one is the way in which casualties are managed and treated. In the First World War, we know that uh, a wounded soldier may not have received definitive care for days after initial wounding. Now, provided in campaigns where there is air superiority, wounded can be treated usually and resuscitated certainly within what's called the golden hour after wounding. And that, I think, is one of the major uh, things that have changed since the First World War.